Before we get into today's episode, it's Black Friday, and I want to announce that my candle shop, Knox and Vesta, has some Black Friday, Small Business Saturday, and Cyber Monday sales. So between now and Monday, here's what's going on. So we are launching a six ounce tin candle. It is much smaller than our original 13 ounces. So if you wanted to try some of the scents, weren't certain before you go for the big one, we have something now. And when you buy two of them, it's called Duos, and there's a $5 discount to buy two of them together. But because it's Black Friday, there's even more of a sale than normal. And of course, the large 13 ounce vessel has the best sale and those are $15 off. We have obviously our nine signature scents in our nine large glass vessels, but all of our nine signature scents are also going to be available in the six ounce vessels too. So make sure you snatch those up this weekend. Go to noxvesta.com, N-O-X-V-E-S-T-A.com to check out the candles. Thank you for calling customer service. How can I assist you today? When you speak to customer service for Disney, Airbnb, AT&T, or even Home Depot, you might expect the person on the other line to be working at a call center. Chances are they're working from home, being paid less than minimum wage to speak to you, and the contract they signed barely allows them to do anything about it. By the end of this episode, we'll all have a healthy reminder of why it's important to be kind to customer service and the incredibly shady, scammy practices that effectively silence them. So hello everyone and welcome to The Corporate Casket, where bad businesses go to die. Today, we're going to be discussing Arise Virtual Solutions, the customer service agents paid by Disney, Airbnb, Comcast, and many more. Although we're aware of the issues with some of these Fortune 500 companies, let's take a look and see if the company handling their phone calls is just as shady. Also, please be aware that this episode does contain brief mentions of sexual harassment. According to their own website, Arise's company roots go back to 1994 when they started off as a tech company named Willow CSN Incorporated, selling a proprietary switch. A few years later in 1997, they started providing call center resources and the company grew massively from there. In 2007, they changed their name to Arise. Presently, they're owned by Warburg Pankus LLC and Vivterra. Although Arise's headquarters is based in Florida, their 20,000 customer service agents work from home. An article from January that year talks about the name change and the opportunity for these work from home contractors as well. It reads, You might have seen the New York Post article last November where it reported that as a call center employee selling tickets to Broadway shows, Gloria Clark dreamed of doing the same type of work at home in Spanish Harlem. A 48 year old single mother of three grown children, she wanted to have flexible hours and be close to her father who's in early stages of dementia. She trolled the internet for opportunities, but was skeptical about the offers she saw. When she found Willow CSN, a Florida-based company that provides Fortune 500 companies with home-based representatives to handle customer calls. After completing basic training to master the necessary skills and technology, she's now ready to go work as a virtual customer service agent, servicing one of Willow's travel clients, such as the startup airline Virgin America. Like other contractors who work for the company, she'll be able to work from home and set her own schedule. Arise claims you can be your own boss too and use the phrase, no commute, no suit on their website. For those of you who enjoy multi-level Mondays, this probably sounds incredibly familiar to you. A work from home opportunity presented as a cure all for your financial difficulties. I'd be skeptical reading this no matter what growth the company experienced. Still to this day, the company says they've won multiple awards such as the Top Workplace in South Florida Award in 2018, the Most Innovative Company of the Year in 2016, the Silver Award for Human Resource Workforce from Workforce Magazine and more. But is this accurate? Well, as it turns out, even the little that we think we know about Arise isn't true. Arise or Willow Corp was actually founded in the late eighties by Richard Cherry, the author of Money Now Safely, Kaching, Instant Gratification, The Trillion Dollar Retail Market Revealed, and The Silver Bullet Obesity Terminator. If you couldn't tell from those book titles alone, Richard Cherry is a questionable shady character himself. He and his wife, Gail Nichols, currently run a website called Fantastic Products Now that is hilariously terrible. There's just no other way to describe it. One section of their website is dedicated to weight loss and it reads, Richard and Gail drink at least eight ounces of fantastic kidney health juice daily. Why? Tastes great and cleanses harmful toxins from the body naturally. 
They also claim that Richard's kidney problems disappeared after drinking his fantastic juice for three months and sold a book called The Almighty Miracle that details how Richard was miraculously cured of his obesity within 90 days. At least here, they explain that it was due to the advice of a renowned cardiologist, so someone with qualifications may have been involved. Still, I'm not sure I'd call following a doctor's health advice a miracle cure. All in all, the website is an utter mess to say the least. It reads like a pop-up ad and I've got some serious Mike Lindell, my pillow website vibes from it. (laughs) But back to the call center. Richard's original intent was allegedly to unlock a workforce of people with disabilities to answer customer service calls from home. And this might sound like a good thing on the surface, Richard wanting to give opportunities to disabled people. But when you consider how these workers are treated, that original intent only makes the situation more upsetting. Though Willow failed in the 90s, Cherry and his wife relaunched in Florida in 1997. One of their earliest and largest clients was none other than the Home Shopping Network. Yet it became increasingly apparent that this really wasn't the easy job Cherry advertised it to be. One Tampa Bay Times article in 2005 read, hundreds of agents who paid Willow up to $2,000 each to get going in their home-based businesses have quit. Willow, which fields about 20% of HSN's calls, struggled to drum up enough new business this summer to keep its agents busy. A rate increase that would have required Willow's remaining 1,400 agents to pay more each month for their telephone hookups was put off. Just like in an MLM, Arise customer service agents have to spend thousands just to become an agent and start their own business. In this case, they may not be paying their employer directly, but the situation remains the same, spending a massive amount of money and being told they'll earn it right back. But as we know, Arise managed to drum up that new business, now representing some of the most recognizable corporate names in the country. In 2006, they were featured on Good Morning America and presented their opportunity as a great stay-at-home flexible job. Workers, on the other hand, say otherwise. So here's how Arise works. A massive corporation contracts with them. Arise then contracts with a smaller independent business, which then contracts the work from home customer service representative creating levels of separation between Arise and the contractor. Many of the quote, incorporated independent businesses are just people who incorporated that would otherwise be a sole proprietor because as ProPublica explains, Arise's business model demands that additional corporate layer. The incorporated independent business likely only has one employee, the founder, who pressures people to sign up and contract underneath them. It isn't quite the pyramid scheme because of the way money flows and where it comes from. It's not all going right to the top, but the money continually flows towards a rise and away from the agents. For example, the training fees and the monthly platform fees that agents pay go to a rise and a monthly service fee goes to the independent business that a rise contracts with. Please know that the words independent business here are very much in air quotes. Arise charges both the top tier like Disney and the bottom tier, the agent. They win no matter what they do while the worker loses. Not to mention Cherry's targeting of vulnerable groups has worked. Those exploited by Arise are overwhelmingly people of color, stay-at-home mothers, caretakers, military spouses, or people with disabilities who have less options in the workforce. Even more shady still is the way that Arise promotes itself. The president of the blog, Girl City, Carrie Coteau, is one of Arise's biggest business partners, yet she repeatedly calls the company a perfect fit for her, speaks as if she has her own business and says there's little upfront cost. She's one of these links in the chain, an independent business, and her language is reminiscent of so many MLMs I've seen before. Carrie claims that she too thought Arise was a scam before realizing it was true work from home opportunity. She doesn't explain what made her realize this or how she owns her own business when by all accounts, she reports to someone else. There are a few reviews on her website that are positive, but you have to make multiple posts promising this is legitimate, then, you know, it's kind of worth questioning why you have to keep making those kinds of posts. Other independent businesses like Diamond House Virtual Services that present as virtual staffing companies also use this language, promising flexible hours and incredible opportunity and overplaying the success you'll find with them. Yet some might find success through this business model, but it's not the opportunity Arise or the corporations who recruit and manage their contractors would have you believe. One former contractor, Tammy Pendergraf, found this out the hard way. She spent $1,500 for home office equipment, took a voice assessment test, paid for and passed their introductory training, which she had to devote three unpaid days to and passed a certification course to provide customer service to AT&T, which took 44 unpaid days. 
After that, she completed an additional 10 days of training for which she was promised pay, which never materialized. Then she signed up for her first shifts. After three weeks of fielding phone calls, Tammy made $96.12. She put in 50 to 55 unpaid hours a week during the AT&T training and paid almost $200 just to take it. Those who didn't pass the training course, about half weren't refunded the cost of training either. Tammy also claims she was obligated to work 20 hours per week, which certainly deviates from the make your own hours and work whenever you want narrative that they try and push. Other sources have done the math and reported that the highest paid wage at a rise is about $12 an hour, whereas the lowest is $2.52. A home office is one thing. Many of us probably have a computer and a desk, but the ones agents use must be compatible with a rise software and they need multiple monitors. Agents are also encouraged to have carpeting and solid doors to block out sounds. No babies crying or dogs barking. The caller has to believe their agent is working in a call center. If agents are asked why their office is so quiet, they'll play white noise or run YouTube videos of call center sounds. Plus, when Arise contractors do finally get a shift, they're often only paid for their time on a call, not waiting for one. That 30 to 40 minutes Tammy spent waiting, those were yet more unpaid hours. And even after that, the job is ruthless. Aside from the awful calls you're bound to get, there are dozens of requirements for the companies that Arise has contracts with, and some of them are just asinine. One Orange County, Florida agent claimed, her average handle time, the industry term for average length of call, had to fall between six minutes, 40 seconds, and 12 minutes, 20 seconds. Commitments to get back to a customer to resolve a particularly complicated issue had to be kept at or below 0.5% of the calls. If she put a customer on hold, the average hold time had to remain below 30 seconds. She could offer a credit on a customer's bill no more than once per 15 calls. And if she determined a customer was indeed owed money, any refunds or deductions had to average less than $2.50 per call. Failure to meet any one of these 25 requirements shall be deemed a breach, the contract said, allowing Arise to terminate her job. An agent who worked in Florida testified that he answered calls for customers for Barnes & Noble. Someone hired by Arise would listen to some of the agent's calls and then send him a scorecard with 40 items. Arise claims that all their requirements are clearly laid out and they're transparent, but a company can still be transparent and abuse their employees. Keeping control of the call, providing complete information, I can understand why Arise would care so much about those things. But if they cared this much, then they should do what every other employer in America is required to do and legally classify their workers as employees, rather than contracting a bunch of people who must pay them for training in a desperate attempt to avoid paying employment taxes. Naturally, the extremely intense environment, the idea that you couldn't do one thing wrong or make one slip up put people on edge. Plus, if something went wrong with a website, like a site-wide glitch on eBay, for example, customer satisfaction ratings were obviously going to go down. Rather than take this into account, contractors have just been fired for it, something completely and totally out of their own control. Worse yet, if Arise suspected you weren't doing your job, they could just show up to your home unannounced and search it. And you heard that right. One former agent claims that two Arise instructors randomly showed up to their home, checked their ID and tested their internet connection. Random drug tests, holiday work, all of that was allowed in these contracts too. Yvonne Corder was an Arise agent for Disney working from home in Arkansas, but she claimed to work from Orlando. She didn't take unauthorized bathroom breaks and when sick from food poisoning, Corder claimed to put collars on hold so she could throw up. I prayed there were no extra monitors listening that day, she said. Arise turned these people's homes into a hostile work environment. Some contracts wouldn't allow an Arise agent to hang up, no matter what a caller said. Women said to be sexually harassed weren't allowed to terminate the call. One young woman in Florida said the man would call on Saturday nights to say, I can hear you typing, I really like the way you type. Another longtime client said she couldn't believe how many perverted calls she had to field on Sunday mornings. They'd say, what are you wearing? Are you naked? Can I do things to you? I figured they got a thrill from skipping church. Naturally, this rule applied to verbal abuse as well. Since when did customer satisfaction trump worker safety? We know we've seen it before and it happens far too often, but this shouldn't be allowed. No contract should force someone to tolerate abuse. And yet here we are. Now, before we dive into the lawsuits that arises involved in, let's take a quick break for a sponsor. You know that feeling when you just happen to find a piece of clothing that's perfect for you? One that you didn't even know you needed and yet you could never live without? For me, it was sweaters. 
Well, that's how you'll feel with Stitch Fix Freestyle, a shop that's built just for you. Stitch Fix Freestyle is your trusted style destination where you can discover and instantly buy curated items based on your style, likes, and lifestyle. Now, as you know, I am a sweater aficionado, a sweater addict, you might say, and Stitch Fix most certainly is the place where I find a lot of new brands that I've never even heard of before. Recently, they sent me this really cute olive sweater and guess what? It had thumb holes. I haven't had a shirt with thumb holes since I think high school and oh, the nostalgia brought me back. And also I keep rewashing the shirt and wearing it like every other day. I'm so in love with it. A sweater with thumb holes. Just when you think I couldn't love sweaters even more, thumb holes are back. I, it's, I'm so sold. How did Stitch Fix know? I don't know how they knew, but they know. And I like that. So get started today by filling out your style quiz at stitchfix.com slash casket. That's stitchfix.com slash casket to try Stitch Fix Freestyle for yourself. stitchfix.com slash casket. Now that hybrid work is becoming the norm, strong workplace teams have two things in common, speed, and alignment. Both come from having one hub where everyone can share work and processes, manage projects, and collaborate with clarity. Notion gives your team one central and customizable workspace that can be tailored to fit any team and bring your teams together so you can move faster. Notion is an all-in-one team collaboration tool that combines note-taking, document sharing, wikis, project management, and so much more into one space that's simple, powerful, and beautifully designed. With Notion, you'll have everything you need in just one spot without the silos and context switching that slow companies down. Find out how Notion may be the missing piece your team needs to grow, get more done, and delight everyone who uses it in the process. Learn more and get started for free at notion.so. You can check it out on your own and invite as many folks as you want to see how it works. Take the first step towards an organized, happy team today, again, at notion.so. Arise has been sued over this behavior so many times, as we've seen with many MLMs, that it's become a mere cost of doing business expense. The first suit happened in 2011 when they, AT&T and Apple, were accused of having yellow dog contracts. In simple terms, this means that signers had to agree that they wouldn't join a union. Yellow dog contracts are unenforceable in the federal court, seeing as they ignore workers' rights to organize. According to the suit against AT&T and Arise, this scheme and these contracts allowed AT&T to avoid all the costs of being an employer, allowing them to avoid paying employment taxes and the prevailing minimum wage. Apple was naturally accused of the same thing. Although there's not quite as much information available about these early suits, 2011 started a trend for Arise, and just about every single year since, they've added a new lawsuit to their collection. In 2012, a lawsuit was filed against them in federal court, Dowell v. Arise Virtual Solutions, alleging that they failed to pay for time spent in training. Arise filed a motion seeking to arbitrate the claims, and the suit was withdrawn without prejudice. Then that same year in October, another suit was filed in the same federal court, Otis v. Arise Virtual Solutions, alleging that the Arise independent contractors are employees because of the way they've directed and controlled and as employees, they should be paid for training courses. A couple months later in early 2013, the 2011 case with AT&T and Apple was settled for just over $1 million. Finally, people were starting to pay attention to Arise. Otis said that in his case, he had spent about $1,500 on the equipment Arise required him to purchase in order to run their system. He paid about $275 for the course and didn't get paid anything for the two and a half months of training he completed. Then once he started working, he realized he wasn't even prepared properly for the work it entailed. It was pretty discouraging, he says. You realize that the training didn't prepare you to actually perform on the phone. And I felt like I had kind of been duped. AT&T had a handbook for how customer service providers were supposed to handle their calls, but Otis says a lot of what is in there hadn't been part of the training. He was supposed to learn it on the job. So when a person called, he'd be sitting there at home, leafing frantically through the book, looking for ways to stall. This would be a typical script for me, he says, putting on his customer service voice. I apologize for the wait. I appreciate your patience. Thank you so much for understanding. Otis says the whole situation was even more stressful because Arise had a rule. Calls shouldn't last longer than 10 minutes. They also shouldn't be shorter than three minutes. So you'd be in danger of getting terminated because people hung up on you because you didn't know what you were doing, he says. Otis hired lawyer Shannon Liz Reardon to handle his case, a name you're bound to hear again since she's become very familiar with Arise in court. Liz Reardon has won cases for clients against Arise in the past, getting them the money they're owed for training. Unfortunately, when you tally it all up, it's only a drop in the bucket for a company so massive. 
In one 2014 case, arbitrator Deborah Hankinson successfully proved that Tammy Pendergraft, the former employee we mentioned earlier, was actually an employee of Arise. They tried to push her issues off of the incorporated business Tammy signed, but following the economic realities test, part of an assessment used by the IRS in some labor departments, their argument didn't hold water. Deborah weighed the six factors of the test. And in return, Tammy received about $6,000. And then because Arise violated the Fair Labor Standards Act, the judge doubled the damages. As thrilled as I am that Tammy got almost $12,000 in her suit, as we said earlier, it seemed like a mere cost of doing business expense for Arise. Occasionally, a former contractor might go through the stress and cost of taking them to court, winning them what was owed, and then Arise would just simply move on to the next one. These suits continued to stack up. Barry Carter sued Arise years later for violating the Fair Labor Standards Act as well as the minimum wage laws. Carter claimed that Arise hadn't paid him for several months of training and that he was told to purchase specific equipment, the same issues we've seen before. Clearly bringing the same lawsuit against them time and time again wasn't working. So let's take a look at what was done to actually change things. One of the first steps in proving Arise's despicable structure was getting the Department of Labor involved. As it turns out, they had quite a few complaints about how Arise was running things. Their failure to pay minimum wage and overtime was noted and 44 violations were recorded. So they took action and forced Arise to change things, right? Happily ever afters are for everyone. No, not here. This is probably one of the most depressing aspects of the case, but the labor department literally walked away from it when Arise politely disagreed with them. Apparently that's all it takes now. If the labor department knocks on your door and says, you owe 20,000 employees over $14 million, all you need to do is say, "Mm, I don't think so. And they'll leave you alone. This was even before the 44 violations were recorded. It turns out the labor department had investigated a rise over 10 years ago in 2010 and met with their lawyers, according to my source. One of the Arise lawyers three years before had been in charge of the very division that conducted the Labor Department investigation, appointed to that position by George W. Bush. The Arise lawyers politely disagreed with the department's findings, according to a report written by the investigator and obtained by ProPublica through a public records request. Arise refused to change its practices. It also refused to pay back wages. They said no to both, one person familiar with the investigation told ProPublica. And with that, the labor department literally walked away, submitted the case as refusal to pay slash comply, and then dropped the case. Not only was this a missed opportunity to set an example, compensate these workers, and retrieve stolen tax revenue, but it's infuriating lack of care for these workers, and the labor department did not care. They have told gig workers that they effectively can't do anything to help them if they've been harmed or scammed, and they sent the message to Arise that they can just get away with it. Arise got that message loud and clear. In 2011, the Director of Enforcement for the Labor Department's Southeast Region, John Bates, instructed the office to only seek back wages for agents that had been interviewed, meaning that unless an agent had reported their issues to the Labor Department, they'd receive nothing. This meant that instead of owing $14 million in back wages, Arise only owed $40,000. Yet even with that massive drop, Arise still refused to admit any wrongdoing and the Labor Department still didn't act. As it turns out, while we know Arise was protecting itself, there may have been a reason for the latter. Around this time, the Government Accountability Office started taking a look into wage and hours division competence to see if the Labor Department was actually taking itself seriously. The GAO made 10 false complaints, five of which were never even filed. The GAO actually posted the recordings of these phone calls to YouTube, and I highly recommend you give them a listen, but here's a sampling of what was said. So you really have no power to do anything? I mean, all you did was just call and ask her to pay me. I mean, Mm -hmm. she just... And well, the thing is is that we explained, I explained the law to her. She knows that she needs to pay you. It's just that she's saying she doesn't have the money to. I can't bring blood from a stone. I am bound by the laws that I'm able to enforce, the money that Congress gives us, and all of that lovely stuff. If you are having a problem with what our office is capable of achieving based on the laws that were written, then you need to let your congressmen. Okay, do you know who your congressmen are? I mean, we can use all the help we can get. Pretty sure politely asking someone to pay you is something the employee would have done themselves. I understand they may be bound by certain laws, but if the wage and hour division doesn't have the legal authority or the budget to punish companies like Arise, then what's the point of the division? Moving on to another example. You're sure you don't wanna just have a nice conversation with him yourself? 
No, no, I don't want because he's a he gets very loud and angry. Okay, well, here's wanna. another avenue that you can pursue. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do you have another job lined up? No, no. Uh -uh. Okay, you might want to do that before you file a complaint with us. Because I can't guarantee that he's not going to fire you. Imagine calling the wage and hour department to file a complaint against an employer that to some extent is mistreating you and you just get told to find another job. Again, supremely helpful. I understand that this problem goes deeper than the WHD and believe me, that could be its own episode. But for now, let's discuss one third and final example before getting back into a rise. This complaint is even more upsetting. A GAO employee left a message for WHD reporting a case of child labor and they stated, I've seen uh, a place, uh, I think it's called it CP&D meat, meat Packaging or something like that in Modesto, California. Um, I've seen kids working there. I believe they're underage. They work, uh, they seem to be working all day, uh, probably during uh, school and working on uh, some, some heavy uh, type of equipment like, uh, I, I guess you call them circle saws. And, uh, and the ones that, uh, the machine that makes like hamburger meat. The WHD never investigated this, nor any file of its database because according to them, they knew it was fake. I'd love to know how they were aware of this complaint and it wasn't real without even bothering to investigate, but I think you get the picture here. It's not hard to believe that with this attitude, they weren't willing to help Arise employees either. Thankfully, there were those who kept suing Arise one person at a time. And finally, after more and more individual suits were settled, Liz Reardon turned to the National Labor Relations Board, the NLRB. The NLRB is responsible for enforcing the National Labor Relations Act, a series of laws that dictates, among other things, that employers can't make employees waive their rights to class action. However, the NLRA doesn't cover independent contractors, so once and for all, the NLRB and Arise needed to determine if Arise had employees or contractors. Matthew Rice, an Arise contractor, testified in court that he worked as an agent under a company his mother formed instead of incorporating. His mom, Patricia, had signed up at least 50 agents in the decade or so that they worked with Arise. Yet when the NLRB lawyer asked if Matthew Rice felt like a big business owner, he said, to me, big business means you're making money and you have stuff. And I don't have all of that. I just, I work from home. Like still today, I live in a two bedroom apartment with a roommate and my son. And now my daughter's there. So I'm still on a couch with no car. So no, I don't consider myself big business. Arise's lone witness was Robert Padron, who at the time was senior vice president and general manager. He described Arise's platform as connective tissue that linked Arise's corporate clients with its network of small businesses and their agents. In 2016, administrative law judge Charles Mull called bullshit on the whole connective tissue bit Arise was trying to sell. He said that Arise's business structure was just an elaborate construct to make their employees seem like independent contractors so Arise could avoid a variety of costly legal obligations. Arise was ordered to rescind all the waivers signed and to stop requiring agents to sign it. The case file, if you'd like to take a look at it, will obviously be in my sources. It summarizes what we've discussed thus far, the hours, schedules, poor pay, and things of that nature. This decision would finally allow Arise agents to stand up for themselves, band together, and sue Arise into oblivion. And well, that's what I wanted to happen. Unfortunately, the Trump administration changed that. You see, Trump nominated Neil Gorsuch to the Supreme Court, and with him writing the majority opinion, it was decided in May 2018 that federal law allows corporations to bar employees from class action lawsuits. Mole's ruling was overturned a few months later, leaving Arise employees once again forced to battle Arise alone, hiring their own lawyers. This is just my opinion, so feel free to take it or leave it, but I would feel incredibly intimidated if I were one of these employees. They are in a massive company working with Disney, AT&T, and big names that I would genuinely never want to go up against. It seems possible that some employees that were taken advantage of would move on and want to put this behind them rather than go through lengthy legal battles to hope that their five or $6,000 would be recovered. That's why these employees need to be able to file a class action lawsuit in the first place. 
make no mistake, Arise knows what they do is shady, which is why they don't hire workers in states with stricter worker protection laws like California, Connecticut, Maryland, Massachusetts, New York, Oregon, and Wisconsin. Florida is notorious for its utter lack of employee protections. And thankfully, this still isn't the end of people attempting to find justice against Arise. The pandemic exacerbated this whole situation. Airbnb announced in May, 2020, that they were laying off a quarter of their workforce. The CEO wrote in a post that quote, was hailed for its empathy and transparency in which he offered a generous severance package, including pay and extended health insurance. This did not include the Arise workers that were under Airbnb contracts. Despite these agents handling all of the day-to-day tasks like bookings, cancellations, and communication between guests and house, they received nothing. April, 2020 saw a massive surge of new agents desperate for work, bringing the Arise workforce to 70,000. However, this year, a new lawsuit has been filed by Shannon Liz Reardon that has the potential to turn Arise on its head. The thing is, Arise only allows the workers to file individual suits against them, right? And one of the reasons why it's difficult for these workers to do so is because some of them may not even be aware of their own rights and legal claims. The company is, according to her, keeping its workers in the dark. One NPR segment reads, Arise told us in a written statement that they've built a platform where agents can choose when, where, and how often they work. But labor lawyer Shannon Liz Reardon argues that's not quite true. In reality, she says, Arise maintains a lot of control over these workers. She says misclassification is increasingly common and she's fought a series of these kinds of cases against Arise. She's not allowed to say exactly how many though, because deep inside the contracts that the agents sign, it says that if you have a problem with Arise, you have to go through private arbitration. The company has prevented a class action lawsuit, but now that could be used against them. That's why Liz Reardon recently asked a court to order Arise to provide her with the names and contract information of the company's customer service agents. If the court grants her this information, she could reach out to these people and inform them that they have legal claims. After all, she has experience fighting a rise in court, so it definitely seems possible that some of these agents would trust her enough to seek that action. And if enough of these 70,000 employees file lawsuits, then a rise would be buried in them. And I really hope this goes through. A rise already has a legal battle they're involved in right now against a former employee, Donna Bell, which was filed in July, 2021. Her story is exactly the same as the ones we've heard before. She wasn't paid for a lengthy training, had to pay for equipment, and didn't even make minimum wage. Again, if this court order goes through, we could be seeing dozens, hundreds, even thousands of cases like Donna's against Arise. Since Liz Reardon filed the lawsuit in Missouri, a state that hasn't yet refused the kind of request she's making, it's certainly a possibility. We'll wait and see, and if this does work, it would certainly be entertaining and validating to see Arise drowning in cases. But with all of that being said, that's where I'm going to end today's episode of The Corporate Casket. Obviously, this is one that's going to need an update down the line when we find out if we're able to get a class action status and obviously what happens and how badly Arise is going to end up hurting from it. But with all of that being said, I wanna say thank you for joining me for today's episode. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, make sure that you're liking, following, and subscribing so that you can stay up to date on all the latest episodes. Thank you so much for spending some of your Friday here with me and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.